morning. Good morning. Our first lesson is from Genesis chapter 39, the first 23 verses. Listen now to this word from God. Now, Joseph was taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord caused all that Joseph did to prosper in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. And he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in house and field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge. And having him, he had no concern for anything but the food which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome and good looking. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph and said, lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Lo, having me, my master, has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my hand. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except yourself, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And although she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie with her or to be with her. But one day when he went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house was there in the house, she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. And when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled out of the house, she called to the men of her household and said to them, see, he has brought among us a Hebrew to insult us. He came in to me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment with me and fled and got out of the house. Then she laid up his garment by her until his master came home, and she told him the same story, saying, the Hebrew servant, whom you have brought among us, came in to me to insult me. But as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment with me and fled out of the house. When his master heard the words which his wife spoke to him, this is the way your servant treated me, his anger was kindled, and Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in prison, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's care all the prisoners who were there and whatever was done there, he was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison paid no heed 
to anything that was in Joseph's care because the Lord was with him and whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. This is the word of God for the people. second lesson comes from Romans chapter 11 verses 1 and 2 and finishes with 29 through 32. Listen now to this word from God. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. And then over to verse 29, finishing with verse 32. For the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God but now have received mercy because of their disobedience so they have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you they also may receive mercy for God has consigned all men to disobedience that he may have mercy upon all the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our Bibles turn to the Gospel of Matthew, the 15th chapter. We'll be looking at verses 21 through 28. Matthew, the 15th chapter, verses 21 through 28. 
And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to a district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and cried, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely possessed by a demon. But he, Jesus, did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she's crying after us. And he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not fair to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Please be seated. In 1966, Glenn Sutton and Epic Records producer Billy Sherrill wrote a classic country and western song called Almost Persuaded. Before I get to that, you've got a pastor that loves real country music. As George Jones said, real country music. That's what I love. Back when it was known as country and western. Anyway, this song, Almost Persuaded, is about a married man who, while patronizing a tavern, sees a beautiful young woman and is instantly smitten with her. Forgetting that he is married for the moment, he nearly succumbs to temptation. Listen to the lyrics of this song, and I want you to find the two things that turn this man back from the sin that he was about to commit, adultery. It begins, all country songs tell stories. Last night, I could could sing it, but I'm not going to. (laughs) Last night, all alone in a bar room, met a girl with a drink in her hand. She had ruby red lips and coal black hair, C-O-A-L. Now that's black, coal black hair and eyes that would tempt any man. And then she came and sat down at my table. And as she placed her soft hands in mine, I found myself wanting to kiss her, for temptation was flowing like wine. And I was almost persuaded to strip myself of my pride, almost persuaded to push my conscience aside. And then we danced and she whispered, I need you. Take me away from here and be my man. And then I looked to her eyes and I saw it the reflection of my wedding band and I was almost persuaded to let strange lips lead me on almost persuaded but your sweet love made me stop and go home did you catch the two things that made him stop the first one was the reflection of what his wedding band every wedding that I've done We use traditional vows. We have a part where we bless the rings. We bless the rings. And the ring is an outward symbol of something that has already happened with these two. They have pledged their hearts to each other, to be faithful only to each other before God and man. And I always say these words, and they repeat after me, me, and forsaking all others, keep only to her or to him in the case of a woman, so long as you both shall live. Secondly, did you catch the second thing that, he, that made him stop and go home? He remembered his wife, how sweet she was, and her love for him. So what did he do in the end? He stopped, and he got the heck out of there, and he went home. Listen, he fled the scene from the ruby red lips and the coal black hair. And he came home where he belonged to his wife. Church, today I've got to tell you something. Sometimes the reasons why we fall into sin 
is we put ourselves into situations that we ought not let ourselves be put into. And listen, it takes real courage to get out and to leave. It's not cowardly. In fact, it's brave. No, no, this is not for me. I'm getting out of here. I'm extricating myself from this situation, which is inviting me into sin. Today we're going to talk about Genesis chapter 39, a story in which Joseph is going to be falsely accused of trying to rape his master's wife. We're going to notice from the text over and over again something really special, that it was, quote, Yahweh who was with Joseph and prospered everything that he did. Now, depending on what version of the Bible we use, and the Lord was with Joseph, but I want you to know something. Sometimes we've got to pop the hood on the engine of Scripture. Eight times in this chapter, it uses the sacred name for God. And in fact, the Joseph story is the longest one in Genesis. It covers from chapters 37 to the end of the book, chapter 50. This is the only time in that entire story that Yahweh is specifically mentioned. Eight times. So what does this tell us? There's a very close relationship between the Lord God and Joseph. All right? A little sidebar about Yahweh. When I was growing up in a Southern Baptist church, I had never heard of that word. And I was in, in a freshman at North Greenville College, and I was in the Old Testament class. I heard Dr. Billy Walsh talk about <laughs> Yahweh. I, I thought they were making this up. I said, you know what? I would have known if this was the name of the God of Israel. <laughs> you can't imagine the hubris of a young man, right? You know, I would have heard of this, but I was so ignorant. I was so ignorant. Modern rabbinical Jewish culture judges it to be forbidden to pronounce this sacred name. In prayers that faithful Jews pray, they pray with substitutes for Yahweh. They will pray to Adonai, which is my Lord. They will pray to Elohim or Eloheinu, our God. And then sometimes Jews are quite clever. They'll come up with a substitute called Hashem, which means that name. <laughs> that name. <laughs> Remember the slogan of Greenville lately? Yeah, that Greenville because there's like 35 states with the Greenville, but we're supposed to be that Greenville. So next time you tell an out-of-state or where you live, you say, yes, we live in that Greenville. Well, this is that name, the name above every other name. And Jews hold it to be too sacred to use. The point that Genesis is making here is that Yahweh is very close with his servant Joseph, and we're going to learn why. Because Joseph remains very faithful in everything he does. The way that Joseph lives his life, even as a slave in a foreign land, Egypt, reveals Joseph's character and integrity as a person. Joseph maintains the proper respect in all his relationships to his God, his earthly master Potiphar, and his relationships with his peers. Scripture records that Joseph is efficient, diligent, and faithful. There is a symbiotic relationship that is at work here. A symbiotic relationship. God honors Joseph because Joseph honors God. Did you catch that? God is honoring Joseph because Joseph is honoring God. In fact, it is through Joseph, his servant, that God honors the covenant promise that he made to Abraham. He told Abraham, I will bless you and all nations will be blessed by me through you and your descendants. See, this prophecy is coming true. This is Egypt. This is Egypt. And Joseph, who is the great grandson of Abraham, is going to be the agent of God's blessing for these people. Scripture says that God prospers everything that Joseph did. From the time that Potiphar made Joseph the head of his household, 
blessings started coming in to the entire household of Potiphar. Potiphar must have wondered, who is this boy? And who is his God? Because ever since I've got this boy in my household, everything is better than it has ever been. Who is this mighty God? Potiphar would not have known. He would have known who Osiris was and other Egyptian gods, but he would have never have heard of the God of Israel. So here is sermon lesson number one. Let us live our lives in a holy fashion so that God will use us to be a blessing for others. Just like St. Francis said, Lord, make me a channel of your peace. We cannot be used by God as a blessing for others if our life is choked with sin and temptation. Secondly, I know that you want me to get to the juicy part. Come on, Pastor, come on. Can you talk about the seduction that Potiphar's wife used to lure this strapping young man that Scripture says was handsome and good-looking? Now, Doug, in the um, contemporary service, he read a different version. Joseph was well-built and good-looking. Pastor, can you get to the juicy parts? Can you describe Potiphar's wife's ruby red lips and her coal black hair and can you describe Joseph's tanned body ooh wee can't you picture that cover on the Harlequin romance novel well this pastor hates to burst your fantasy bubble but Potiphar's wife's appearance is never mentioned funny because it does say two things about Joseph that he was handsome and good looking or well-built and good-looking. So it's not that the writer is opposed to stating what someone looked like. It's just Potiphar's wife's description isn't given. you got to wonder about that. I think it's a testimony of the fact that it doesn't matter how she looked. She was not for Joseph. She belonged to someone else, right? And speaking of not telling us details, we never know, learn her name. She's Potiphar's wife. There's never a name given to this woman. And I thought about that because in the telling of this story, every one of us could drop in the name of any other person. If we don't set boundaries, holy boundaries, we can invite ourselves into troubles. So I think that might be why her name is not mentioned. Now, as far as seduction goes, <laughs> what seduction? Potiphar's unnamed wife just repeatedly said to him something like, come to bed with me, or in the King James, come lie with me. The New Interpreter's Bible commentary states, foregoing all preliminaries, there was no preliminaries. She presents the matter in terms of power rather than love, of command rather than seduction. You see, here's what she's thinking. This boy's a slave. He belongs to my husband. Therefore, I can command him to do what I want him to do. Think about that disgusting attitude. Because he's a slave, his body belongs to me as well as his soul. Disgusting. She thinks she can order this slave to do whatever she commands. But Joseph understands something differently. He tells her right off, listen, my master has put me in charge of this household and my name is the equal to his. In this household, the name of Joseph and Potiphar have equal weight. Boy, that's pretty bodacious for a slave to say. And then he says, all things in this household have been given to me except for one thing, you and you are his wife. You belong to him. So you think about that. Joseph answered it with stating the power relationship meant nothing because he was the one who actually had been given the power by the master. So he didn't need to obey her command. Secondly, he says to her, plus, this would dishonor my master and it would dishonor my God. This is not for me to do. You see, Joseph's conduct was written in his heart. 
He didn't need to stop and have a think-see about what he should do. He didn't need to say, would you stop and um, I'm going to go talk to a rabbi about this. Is this permissible? He knew instinctively that this was wrong. He saw the reflection of her marriage even if she didn't see it. Even if she didn't see it. In this case, Joseph has internalized the word of God. Sermon point number two. God's word is most effective when it is written in your heart. As the psalmist says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Dear church, it's not enough to intellectually know God's word. It's not enough. We need to go well beyond just studying it and memorizing it to what I call the application phase. So what are you going to do with this word? How does it apply to you and the way you live and the moral choices you make? And in fact, we need to live scripture and breathe scripture and therefore become scripture. You've heard many preachers say it, that the way you're living your life right now is the only what? Bible that some people will ever read. The way you're living your life is the only Bible that some people will ever read. And if that be the case, what would our life tell people about our God? Our life is an open book for anyone. And what is your life bearing witness to? What is it that's very important the next thing that I want us to know is that today people so trivialize the role of the devil. Hollywood has transformed him into a character that you'd want to have a beer with. They've transformed him into somebody that's a fun guy. <laughs> no, no, and no. Let me tell you what I feel about him. He's evil. He's a tempter. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. I don't want him in my life, and I don't want him in my family's life, and I don't want him in your life, and I don't want him in your family's life, and I don't want him in my church's life. We must, must not take for granted that we are strong enough by ourselves to deal with him. No, no. 1 Peter 5, 8 warns the devil's attacks are very real, and he's always probing for the weak area. Listen to what it says. Be alert. Be on watch. Your enemy, the devil, roams around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Church, do not underestimate the devil's power of temptation by putting yourself into a position of vulnerability. Stay well grounded to God through his word and his Holy Spirit. The last thing that I want to point out to you today is what action Joseph took when he was in a situation where he was confronted by sin. What did he do? He left. He got out of there in a hurry. Now, let me ask you something. Was that a cowardly thing to do, church? Let me ask it again because I didn't hear many of you. Was that a cowardly thing for him to do? No. It was the bravest thing he could have done. He fled that scene. He got out of there. He remembered God's commandments. Church, we need to be more like Joseph. We don't need to just run away from sin. We need to pursue righteousness and the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Paul was always so concerned with young Timothy. So he said in the letter that we call 1 Timothy... But you, Timothy, man of God, avoid all these things. Strive for righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Church, when you and I face temptations to sin, remember that we're not alone. Never forget that the Holy Spirit lives in our hearts, and the Holy Spirit is God within us. Paul reminds us of this in 1 Corinthians. But God keeps his promise, and he will not allow anything, allow you to be tested power to remain firm. 
May God help us all to be more like Joseph, faithful to God's commands in our lives. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.